Good morning. My name is Amy Rezneski, and I'm a professor of organizational behavior here at the school. I would like to welcome all of you to the Gordon Grand Fellowship event at the Yale School of Management. Before introducing today's guest, who is the 2015 Gordon Grand Fellow, I want to give a brief bit of background on the fellowship itself. Gordon Grand graduated from Yale College in 1938 and went on to become the president and CEO of the Olin Corporation. During his life, Mr. Grand worked to bridge the gap between business and academia by actively promoting the exchange of ideas between these sectors. This fellowship, which invites business leaders to Yale, was established in 1973 to honor Gordon Grand. This, the visits promote dialogue and understanding between business leaders and Yale students and faculty. It is now an honor to introduce today's speaker, Danny Meyer, the CEO of Union Square Hospitality Group. Danny grew up in a family that relished great food, cooking, get-togethers, travel, and hospitality. Thanks to his father's travel business, he spent much of his childhood eating and traveling. It's perhaps not surprising that his passion uh, for food and wine developed uh, from that. In 1985, at the age of 27, Danny launched Union Square Cafe. The restaurant paired imaginative food and wine with caring hospitality, comfortable surroundings, and outstanding value. This was novel at the time in the US. Union Square Cafe was the first of many successful restaurants Danny opened across a wide variety of types, including upscale dining spots, urban barbecue joints, a jazz club, a Roman trattoria, four modern museum restaurants and cafes, and as we know well here in New Haven, Shake Shack. His group has also launched a catering company and Hospitality Quotient, a learning and consulting business. While the company has expanded and innovated over the last 30 years, it has maintained its commitment to consistent excellence and warm hospitality. Additionally, the Union Square Hospitality Group believes that the key to successful gro growth while keeping, quote, true to its soul, end quote, is to attract, hire, and keep great people. Therefore, the group prioritizes its employees above all else. The group adheres to a belief that taking care of each other is the foundation that enables excellent hospitality for guests, suppliers, investors, and the community. It is not surprising that 83 of his employees have worked for the company for more than 10 years. Danny is also an active national leader in the fight against hunger, serving on the boards of Share Our Strength and City Harvest. For over 30 years, the restaurants in his group have donated leftovers to City Harvest. Finally, I want to mention one item that was in the news earlier this year. In January, Shake Shack made its debut on the New York Stock Exchange, with shares more than doubling on the first day of trading. I know you are all eager to engage with Danny, so the plan for today is I will ask him a few uh, questions to get our conversation going, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, but with that, I would ask you to please join me in welcoming Danny Meyer to Yale Thank you. So my first question for you is, uh, may go back a ways, but it's to ask about when you knew, when you first knew that you would be devoting your life to this work. I never knew, honestly, that I would be devoting my life to this work. I, I think what happened, and I've, I've told this story before, so if you've read Setting the Table, sorry, but um, on the eve of taking my LSATs, having been a poli-sci major back in those days, what do you do with that? You you either become a lawyer or, you know, I was sort of interested in journalism school um, because I liked issues of the day. I always cared about urban renewal and planning and um, anyway, literally I freaked out the night before my LSATs and I was having dinner with my aunt and uncle in uh, New York and my uncle at the time was an oral historian at Columbia and he started saying, so you must be really excited about being a lawyer. And I said, I'm not. And he said, well, what the hell are you taking your LSATs for? And I said, because I don't know what else I would do. And he, he dropped his pasta spoon at that point, And he said, you've got to be crazy. You're going to be dead forever relative to being alive for one minute. Why in the world would you not do something you're passionate about? And I said, because I don't know what else to do. And he was the one who said, what are you talking about? All I've ever heard you talk about your whole life is food and restaurants. Uh -huh. And I, 
I was so blind to what I was passionate about that even then I said, so should I just go eat in restaurants my whole life? <laughs> and he said, you're crazy, just go open a restaurant. But I just want to remind everyone in this room, most of whom were not born when I opened Union Square Cafe in 1985, that it was not considered to be a valid or credible career choice if you had been privileged enough to have a good education in this country. And one of the things I feel best about all these years later mm -hmm. was that this is, if, if you're an entrepreneur and, and you want to take something that you love, share it with other people, build jobs, help to transform communities, I don't know of too many better ways to do it than via food. And so that wasn't the case back then, and that's why it wasn't obvious to me. Yes. But the final thing I want to answer to your question is, is that even when I, I said, all right, I'll take the LSATs, and I never bothered applying to one law school uh, after that, it still never dawned on me that I would do this as a career. It was the same way that any entrepreneur has to scratch the itch, even though he or she knows you're not supposed to scratch the itch. I just had to give birth to this restaurant. Yes. And I knew that it would either fail, but it would be out of my system, or it would work and be out of my system, and then I could go do something else. I never dreamed that, that it would work, and number two, that, that I would keep opening restaurants all these years later. Okay. Um, to, to say it worked is perhaps an understatement. Uh, and in thinking about uh, the kinds of things that have helped it to work so well over all of these years, um, it's hard not to think of the very deep service orientation and hospitality orientation toward delighting people um, who are your guests, but also the people who are part of the organization. Um, and I wanted to ask about where that came from. Was that always part of the orientation to what it would mean to open a restaurant and to serve? Well, again, it was so, so much of my own learning has been um, trying to make intentional what had always been intuitive mm -hmm. and trying to catch myself doing what's right, not just catch myself what's doing wrong. I think in business and in life or in sports, we become expert at looking at the tape and saying, you know, if I had just made my swing a little bit better, my follow through a little bit better, I could have gotten more hits. And so we're really good at looking where we made mistakes, less good at doubling down on the things that were working really well. And so however I'm wired, uh, or why ever I'm wired, however I'm wired, I like to try to assess how somebody feels and figure out what I can do to make them feel even better. I'm lucky that I can do that via food, but I, I would say that any product on earth, whether you're a doctor, you wouldn't believe how many doctors who have all these degrees on their wall about their ability to get you better don't know how to make you feel better. And same thing with lawyers, and same thing with professors, and same thing with real estate brokers and travel agents. And I, I just found that I'm wired to, I actually want you to feel, I want you to feel better after this interview than you felt before you start. Well, thank um, you so much. And you will, you'll see. <laughs> but but here, here's the thing. If I could do that via food, yes. which I love, or by, via what goes into the glass, which I love yes. a lot, hey. <laughs> All the better. All right. Um, it, it may hearten you to know that one of the things we do with all of our MBA students here at the school um, is an exercise that focuses them on getting a lot of feedback on what they do best and well without even realizing it as a way to open up pathways to thinking about what, it, what might it mean to do what you've described, which is uh, to deploy that in their lives and potentially in their professional lives. Um, I want to interrupt your, your train of thought. I actually learned this management lesson from my late grandma Louise back in St. Louis. And she was an expert gardener. She had uh, her apartment building, which was a high rise in St. Louis, about seven stories tall, um, had a plot of land in the parking lot and they gave it to her. They called it carbon monoxide gardens. And she would have me come in as a um, six year old, a seven year old, an eight year old. And she taught me how to weed her garden for her. Um, she gave me the gardening gloves. I think she took a page out of Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer, you know, having me do all of her work. But by the time I got to be nine years old, I was expert on identifying all the weeds came spring. And um, 
by the time I was nine, I went for the weeds and she gently took my hand and she said, this year I'm gonna teach you how to garden. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, the trick to gardening, and she had a green thumb like he couldn't believe, is feeding the flowers and ignoring the weeds. And she said, because when the flowers flourish, the weeds don't get any, the weeds never grow as tall, they don't get the sunlight, and they just die on their own. And the reason that I have looked back on that as the greatest managerial lesson I ever got uh, that, that I applied daily in business is twofold. Number one is to truly try to focus intentionally on what's working well. Yes. But also when it comes to employees, every organization I've ever met has the exact same bell curve of employees. There are people who are hopelessly not ever going to work out, even though you, you did the best you could to hire the right people. Then there's people who you could lock in a closet forever mm -hmm. and they're going to come out full of sunshine whistling, you know, zippity doo dah, and they're going to be great. But I think the vast majority are in the middle of the bell curve and they will go, they're like sunflowers and they will go wherever the sun is shining. And so the biggest mistake I made early on as a restaurateur was to constantly focus as much attention and energy on trying to correct the hopelessly, I'm never gonna make it group, and failing, rather than focusing on the group that are stars even if they don't get fed. And what happened is that therefore the gravitational pull of the many who want the attention of the sun or, or the, the leader, were, they actually made my job harder. So it's just, it was a great lesson to feed the flowers. Um, it's, it, that's a beautiful image. Um, I'm wondering, so as I think about the, the students who are in the group today, um, many of them will go into, uh, you could call it service firms, but of different types. So in professional services, in um, serving nonprofits via law, some of them, uh, via uh, banking, via consulting, and so on, which at their heart, one could argue, are service industries. And so uh, the culture and the model that you've built in the group of restaurants that you have and in, in the broader uh, corporation um, is one that some might be tempted to say works in hospitality service. But I'm wondering if you think there's applicability across these boundaries into these other worlds. And if so, um, how that might work. I think one of the problems with the word hospitality, at least as it classically applies to one small narrow set of industries like restaurants and hotels, um, cruise ships maybe, is completely misunderstood. I, I think we are absolutely in a hospitality economy right now and I wanna just make sure that people understand what I mean to broaden the meaning of the word. We wanna get 100 on our test. Um, we want every one of our stakeholders to say we made their lives better starting with our employees and then our customers and then the communities in which we do business, um, our suppliers and our investors. And the only way to do that is to get it as close to 100 on our tests as possible. And what we've learned is that um, your performance, no matter what you end up doing, whether you're selling homes or you have a website or whether you have a hardware store or a restaurant or you're running a hospital, or you're running a university, how well you do what you do today only gets you to the 49 yard line. And the reason it only gets you to the 49 yard line, assuming you have employees and you have competitors, is that how that experience feels to those stakeholders mm -hmm. has become so much more important today than it ever was and that 51% since you want to get a, since 49, you could be perfect at what you do in my business mm -hmm. and you'd get a failing 49 grade because absent hospitality, which is how did you make the recipient of your performance feel, you're gonna lose. And we're in a day and age where everything you do is now copyable. The shelf life of innovation is literally three seconds long today because as soon as word gets out that the thing you do, even though you invented it, um, it's so copyable. It's, in the old days it wasn't. And so you could get a 10 year running start just by, 
having a new idea and doing it better than anybody else. But now, the minute you have a great idea, everybody knows it in a nanosecond. Everybody can copy it in two nanoseconds. And what does that leave? It leaves a, an entire category called hospitality, which has nothing to do with food or hotels. It has total applicability to government. Yes. It, has, it has applicability to everything. And it's like, we are now competing more than, as you said earlier, more than ever before for having people on our team who have the kind of emotional skills that we call having a high hospitality quotient, a high HQ which I think is so much more important even than having a high IQ. Mm -hmm. We want people on our team who are fed themselves by making other people feel better while in the process of being the best in the world at what they do. Yeah. One last thing, I, I would, anybody watched the, uh, the NCAA men's finals last night? I guarantee you that if you look at the Duke um, bench, you would have seen exactly what I'm talking about in action. You saw people who were champions at what they do. They're, they're, you know, the physical fitness off the charts, the technical ability to make plays and to follow plays and to follow a game plan off the charts. But the other thing you saw, you saw a team of people who were happiest because they were making each other feel good. And then they made their fans feel good. And then they made their whole community of alumni and everybody in you know, North Carolina feel great. It's just, it's just an amazing um, virtuous cycle that works in any, any organizational endeavor there is. Okay. I want to loop back to, uh, to something that you just said in your comments um, to this question, and that is uh, it's instant that people will know what it is that you're up to, um, and in the next second they can begin making their plans to execute on what it is that you've done. Um, with that in mind, I'm curious about uh, whether you're surprised at how hard it's been for others to successfully imitate the model that you've created, that you've now sustained for decades. I don't think it is that hard. As a matter of fact, in the same way that we've written, our chefs have written cookbooks to help you to replicate recipes for food that you can get in our restaurants. I wrote a book called Setting the Table, which was a recipe for exactly what we do yeah. to make a product that not only tastes good, but feels good uh, to all of its stakeholders. Because I wanted to share that recipe. I believe that you know a rising tide lifts all boats. And actually, I'm one of these kind of people that's wired that the more competition I have, the better I do. Mm -hmm. Tell me I can't do something, and that's the best way to motivate me. Yeah. And so I actually like having more competitors out there. Mm -hmm. And I think that, in fact, I would say that in, in the close to 30 years now that I've been a restaurateur, um, I think that hospitality is at a higher level in this country than it's ever been. I think that the, the profession mm -hmm. is attracting uh, more and more gifted people. We have Ivy League uh, students out the wazoo um, throughout our organization, people who have said, this is a viable career choice for me. Yes. Um, whoever wrote the rule that everything I've learned about organizational theory and management theory doesn't apply to restaurants. You know, when I first got into this business, besides half my family saying, don't go into the business, it's a rotten business, uh, the other half of the family saying, don't go into the business, it's the hardest business on earth, it's neither. It's, it's like any business, which is, it's a series of problems to solve on a daily basis that involve, you know, coaxing an organization of human beings to pull in one direction for a higher purpose, for the purpose of creating uh, a best-in-class product. And I think it's important that anyone say, all right, that's what I'm gonna be doing, whatever I do. I may as well be doing it around a topic that actually excites me, because I think at the end of the day, a defining factor in success is taste. And when I say taste, I don't just mean how does food taste, but you know, if you're going to go into the art gallery business, you're going to be solving problems. But if you can solve problems and apply a special magical power you have that happens to be a taste for art, or if you have a special magical power that happens to be a taste for um, <coughs> fill in the blank, what, what, whatever organizational direction you happen to go in, 
if you can apply your magical interest, taste, and powers to general management theory and the emotional skills that go into caring about why that product actually matters to people and, and, and engage the people in your community to actually care for your success, you're going to win. Um, I, I have to say, as a, as a note to your comment about this becoming a, a more and more uh, viable career path in the view of um, a, broader, a broader group of people, um, we had talked about this a bit before, that uh, one of the doctoral students um, at the Stern School of Business uh, was doing her dissertation uh, at Union Square Cafe um, as, as her dissertation data site. And sometime something happened during that study where she made the decision that rather than going into academia, um, she would join you and is now helping to run Hospitality Quotient. And so um, I, we're, we're all She's very, not helping to run it. She, she's running it, She yes. founded it and is running it. And, uh, and if someone had told me that, you know, <clears throat> one of the businesses that we would launch would be a consulting business yes. called Hospitality Quotient, which doesn't serve food, doesn't play jazz music like our jazz club, doesn't cater events, but rather works with uh, best of class organizations, mm -hmm. retailers, airlines, hotels, hospitals, famous hospitals around the country who are already best in the world at what they do, but now want to append onto yes. that technical skill the whole set of gifts that says, oh, and by the way, how can we make our stakeholders feel even better? Yes. My, my sense is that, that if you can write about it on your, if you, if you can take a picture of it on your smartphone, it's copyable. But if you can't, then it becomes probably in the realm of the delivery of hospitality. Mm -hmm. So the great thing about this 51% hospitality um, aspect to what anybody can do is that it's not as copyable. You cannot take a picture yeah. of an emotional transaction and just copy it. And so that becomes a really, really strong competitive advantage for any organization that has employees and customers. Great. Um, with that, I'd like And to competitors. Yes. <laughs> The more the better. Um, with that, I'd like to uh, open open it up to our audience today. I know that there are many of you who have questions um, that you'd like to ask, and so um, I'm I'm here to uh, to help moderate that. And so I'll open the floor at this point. Yes. Thanks so much for, for coming. Uh, uh, question about when you're considering opening new ventures, uh, things that you consider out of the team concept location. Um, which of those three, or perhaps there are others, uh, which of those do you consider at what level of uh, priority do you do? I'll, I'll be willing to accept any of those three in any order as long as the first one is the most compelling. And I think that's a fantastic question. So with Union Square Cafe, which was my very first restaurant, I had this idea that I just had to give birth to. What I didn't have was the right location or the right chef. So it started with the right idea. With Gramercy Tavern, which was my second restaurant, I had a chef I really wanted to work with, a guy named Tom Calicchio. And I didn't have the right idea or the right location, so I had to find that. And then I'll take Shake Shack as an example, or Maialino, our Italian restaurant, um, or The Modern, which is our, 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 our restaurant we're about to open called Untitled, because we couldn't think of a better name, at, at the Whitney Museum. <laughs> And in those cases, the venue came first. And I kind of like when that happens. And the venue was then in search of the right idea and the right chef. And the reason that I kind of like, I'll, I'll take them in any order whatsoever if the, if the first one is really powerful. But the thing that I, that I have fun with as a puzzle is if you provide the framework, the context, Okay, it's a museum, it's a park, it's a, it's a hotel in this neighborhood. Then it's fun for me to paint the right picture that belongs in that frame. The goal of which would be that you would walk in and say, well, of course that's what they did there. What else could they have done there? And, and if, if, if you walk into any of those places, like Shake Shack was really solving a problem. What would you do? if you had a 20 foot by 20 foot plot in Madison Square Park? Well, of course it would be Shake Shack. 
<laughs> it would be. What else? And, and the same thing holds true for any of those. But it, the answer to your question, any of those works, but I do like context coming first because it's a fun thought process for me. We had another question back here, yes. Hi. Thanks for coming. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you maintain quality, how you guys have scaled up so much? Was that the original Madison Square Park location right after it opened? Better than the one in New Haven, and you're both awesome. So. <laughs> Why don't we just end right here? Um, that's it. <laughs> it won't get any better than that. We asked ourselves that question a lot. Um, and, I, and by the way, we're not only interested in consistent quality, what we're really interested in is consistent culture, which is um, not just does it taste the same, but does the experience feel the same? And I think that making it consistently taste the same is somewhat less complicated than making it consistently feel the same because systems and recipes can drive consistent flavor, whereas how you hired and how you trained and what your relationship is to your community is, is really the thing that's gonna drive the culture of the business. And the culture I would describe as how we do things around here. Um, we can talk more about culture later, but we do it by being really intentional about it. And we do it because for years, I couldn't answer your question because the road is littered with, with businesses of all types, not just food businesses that found that growth equaled a diminution in the culture. We've seen it with airlines. Uh, we've seen it with hotel groups. We've seen it with restaurants where it just doesn't feel like the first one felt. And people like you would, would ask, so how are you gonna do it? And for five or six years I said, I don't know, but if we can figure that out, that's, that's the million dollar question. And finally, about three years ago or so, a, uh, an organizational development guru of mine, um, I had breakfast with her and I said, help me, help me answer this question. How can, we, how can we sustain our culture even with all this growth? I didn't talk to her about how can we make the shroom burger taste the same everywhere. That's not her area of specialty. And she said, you know, sometimes when you can't answer a question for this many years, rather than looking at yourself as if you just, you know, don't have the intellectual tools to answer the question, maybe you need to reframe the question. I get to do that? But, that, but that's not what they're asking. She said, don't worry about what they're asking. And so, she said, what, what if you actually needed growth to advance your culture? How could you use your growth to advance your culture? And so what was great about that moment was it unleashed a whole different set of imagination. And so we said, great, the first thing we need to do is define culture. What, what do we mean by, what did we mean by sustaining culture? And what, do, what would we mean by advancing culture? And we found that sustaining culture is, is a failing endeavor. Just ask a shark. Ask a shark who tries to tread water if that's, that's sustaining culture, if that's better than advancing culture. Sharks die if they don't keep swimming forward. Ask your, um, go to your favorite pizza place here in New Haven and ask, you know, ask those yeast cultures if they want to be sustained or if they want to grow you know, while they're proofing the dough. Cultures want to, they want to evolve and grow. So the first thing was, let's stop trying to sustain something. Let's name what it is, what we want it to be, how it can constantly evolve. And then let's see if we can use, in the same way you can use growth to improve your purchasing power um, or to, to use your resources to do a better job with real estate acquisition. Why can't you use your growth in very, very intentionally to actually advance the parts of your culture that you want to see advance. That's what we're doing right now. And um, I would hope that if you, if the, the best compliment you could give me about uh, Shake Shack here in New Haven would be that it's just as active a member in its community of New Haven as Madison Square Park is in its community uh, in the Flatiron District of New York. And that the 
you know, the way we hired people. I remember when we first, Yale is our landlord, by the way, and the very first question we asked, uh, which connected to our culture was, can you tell us where the city of New Haven most needs more people employed? And can you lead us to that pocket of New Haven? And can you help recruit people who we can interview for jobs? Because um, we wanna be a great member of this community. And what I can tell you proudly is that close to 90% of the uh, hourly workers at your Shake Shack here in New Haven um, have never even had a job before this one. It's a little told story that Shake Shack is not only a great job training program, but there's a career path that we build in so that if you work at Shake Shack, you know that if you do this, you can actually advance not only your compensation, but your professional skills right up to and including becoming a manager. And every manager at Shake Shack was offered stock options when Shake Shack went public. So we're really, really excited. That's, the, that's what I'm much more excited about even then, hopefully the French fries taste as good here as they taste <laughs> down in Philadelphia. Um, other questions? Yes. Please. Hi, thanks for coming. I worked in a couple of restaurants where setting the table was the Bible, and I definitely subscribe to the customer orientation and uh, always thinking of trying to be empathetic towards the customer. But one thing that I, I felt and I struggled with as a server was you have limited time, and as a service industry and business, time is kind of the resource you need to make good on the promise of customer relationships. And at least in the dining room, I felt bad sometimes paying more attention to some tables while other tables kind of watched me do that uh, while I wasn't paying attention to them. So I guess in restaurants and in business, like how, what, what are your criteria for figuring out how to allocate your time? Like what customers are the most important, or how do you balance? Well, thank you for your question. You're, ask, you're asking a really good question because it's, I think that time is the last great luxury on earth. It's the only thing that no matter how much money you have, you don't have enough of it and you can't just go buy it at Costco. So you gotta, you gotta figure out how to allocate time in anything you do, your studies, my business, you, the experience you had as a server. Um, and I, I feel like if you got one lesson from setting the table, it was that our team, our employees, cannot provide a higher level of hospitality to their guests than they feel uh, is being given them in the first place. And I don't just mean it's my job as a paternalistic boss to take care of my staff. I actually hold our staff members accountable for how they take care of each other. But you could have a system in that restaurant that's preventing you from being able to spend the time you need with each table. It could be that the management of the restaurant, just by virtue of changing the seating chart uh, or the station chart, or just by virtue of not adding one additional hourly employee as a support mechanism for their servers, is actually not doing a good job of taking care of you and therefore you cannot be taking great care of your guests. So part of our job as leaders, I wanna be very clear, culture fits into the 51%. 51% on its own is also a failing grade. We have to be amazing at the technical aspects of our business, and a big part of that is having the systems to set our team up to win. Um, and it sounds to me, if, if, if a service in any business, whether it's a department store or a restaurant or a drugstore, is crashing and burning, um, meaning they, they just can't get people through the lines or they can't spend time to answer questions of guests. My sense is that that's not a hiring culture problem as much as it is a systems design problem. And that's just part of what we're expected to be good at. We'll take this question, yes. Some of the new 
Um, thanks for that question. So, uh, the real, the honest answer is figuring it out right now. Um, actually, I, I do think it's important to note that I'm the CEO of Union Square Hospitality Group, which remains a privately held company and a group of privately owned restaurants. Shake Shack is a public company. I'm the chairman of the board and I'm the founder, but Shake Shack has its own CEO, who's an incredibly gifted CEO, who happens to have grown up through our fine dining business. He's still in his 30s, uh, Randy Garuti. We have an incredibly gifted CFO. And I'd say for the past five or six years, we've been building Shake Shack so that as your parents did with you, Shake Shack could be independent of the family in which it grew up. We've also had a board of directors at Shake Shack for the past uh, close to six years. And I've led that board of directors. Not, not that we ever knew Shake Shack was going to be a public company, because we didn't. In fact, I think it was roughly, it was actually less than a year ago that we even started taking that conversation seriously. But having served on three different public boards myself, not to mention a huge number of not-for-profit boards, I've learned a lot about governance. I've also learned about Sarbanes-Oxley. I've learned about comp committees and audit committees and all the kind of things that truly are the difference because they become required as opposed to optional. And so I think that Shake Shack was lucky to, to have evolved with, with an eye towards becoming an independent, maybe one day public company. And therefore the transition has not really been that hard. That said, I think that the process of going public, which was uh, January 31st of this year, and the months leading up to it with all the SEC filings, et cetera, was a huge time suck for sure. We knew that going in. We had to hire an enormous number of people uh, for our team that we otherwise would not have needed to hire, people who do tax reporting, people who, um, who are completely helping us with compliance issues that did not used to exist before. Um, that's great. We're, we've got a fantastic team. And the key thing is there's, a, uh, there's two things hanging on the wall of our CEO at Shake Shack. One is the original uh, menu that I scribbled out in four minutes for the first Shake Shack. And then next to that is, is something that he wrote, which is the bigger we get, the smaller we need to act. And those are both there as reminders that whether you're a private company or a public company, you got to stick to who you are. And you, can't, you cannot allow yourselves, even though you have to do quarterly earnings reports, and you've got all this noise out there of analysts saying, buy, don't buy, hold, here's what the stock's going to be. We never had to worry on a day-to-day -day basis what our company was worth. It was irrelevant to us. And in fact, now the only reason that we really pay attention on occasion is that we pretty much devoted our entire directed share program to our employees. So a huge number of our shareholders work both at Shake Shack and at Union Square Hospitality Group. I, I want to make sure those guys make money over time, not to mention whoever else bought the stock. Um, but truly, if you start running your business in a different way with a different set of of cultural priorities, that's a great recipe for, for failure. And, and so I could answer many, many more things that are completely not different than things that are different. Great. Um, let's go up here to the back, yes. Uh, sorry, can you? Yes, okay. yes. <laughs> um, I used to work at Creative Artists Agency, and I remember when I started, I was so surprised that there were so many <clears throat> chefs who were clients. Um, and when Tom Colicchio left the industry, everyone had to stop eating a craft, <laughs> which was kind of annoying because it was right downstairs. Um, but I'm wondering how you think that those celebrity chefs might be changing the restaurant industry and changing the culture or the way that you might think about sort of your business in that it's a growing... Well, yeah, enormously. Um, the, the celebrity chef, which I think really came up with the Food Network and all the reali reality TV shows, but... In all fairness, I grew up with a couple of them, Julia Child and, you know, 
She was a pretty good celebrity chef, um, albeit from Cambridge, not New Haven. <laughs> and uh, so they've been around for a while, but I think they've changed the industry dramatically because it's been one more signal post to parents that it's okay for my kid to go into the food business because maybe they could one day be a famous chef on TV. Not that that should be the primary reason to want to do it. Um, so that's been a good thing. I think that many, many more really, really smart, engaged entrepreneurial people have been attracted to our industry. The second big um, component of the celebrity chef movement is that we're in a day and age uh, where um, food is really one of the few things that your iPhone cannot actually produce. <laughs> it, can help, it can help you order it. There will be a day when you, know, you can push a button and a steak will come out of your iPhone. I don't know that I want to be there for that moment, but with 3D printing, something's going to work like that. But, but here's the thing. You can order food. You can learn about you can take a picture of your wine label, and it'll tell you everything you need to know about that wine, and if you like that wine, every other wine that you would like. There are so many things you can do with it, but what's great about, um, about the, the celebrity chef movement is that if you think about real estate um, throughout this country, there are three drivers right now, the first two drive me crazy, and that's banks and drugstores on every corner, because they're driving real estate prices so high, uh, along with some other national retailers. But food, if you think about uh, all the malls and shopping plazas in this country today, there's a complete, and you, if you imagine that they're all magazines, there's a complete editorial makeover happening, or they're going to die, because if I could as an alternative to visiting your mall, just order that something in the comfort of my own home with my, with my smartphone, I'm not going to visit your mall. But food is the one thing that I still have to go out to, to have that social experience with other people, no matter how I order it. I could order my food online, or I could make my reservation online, but I still am going to go to that place to have it cooked for me, to pick it up. It may even be delivered to me, but there needs to be that real estate. The celebrity chefs have become such brands that whether it's hotels or casinos or shopping malls or sports stadiums, they, they've become brands. Now, I would argue that most of them have not become great restaurateurs. That's my own bent. Um, but, I, but on the other hand, most restaurateurs don't have the brand power to be the reason you would want to go there on, on your own. Great. We have a question over here. Yes. Um, thank you for sharing your experiences with us today. Um, I, you've spoken a lot about the importance of culture within the organization and the imagery around sunflowers and people as sunflowers really resonated with me. And so I was curious, actually, about some of the characteristics that you think are detrimental in building up a team and an organization, what those characteristics would be, and then how, as a leader, you have critical and often difficult conversations with perhaps troublesome team members. Um, boy, you guys are asking the best questions here. <laughs> we could just talk and do this all afternoon if, if we had the time. It's something that is so critically important. I, I learned, I've been learning this, you know, your, your work is never done. That's thing number one. I've been learning this just in an ongoing way. About four years ago or so, my colleague who you worked with or you, you went to school with, Susan Salgado, uh, helped us to engage with an organization called Great Place to Work Institute. And you've probably heard of them because annually their list of the top 100 great places to work is published in Fortune magazine. And so we took the survey ourselves, uh, which is a really, really in-depth experience. And in, it's, we took it restaurant by restaurant so that we could measure 
is it a great place to work at Union Square Cafe versus North End Grill versus The Modern versus, we took it at every single Shake Shack. Is it a good place to work at Shake Shack New Haven versus Shake Shack in DuPont Circle, Washington, D.C.? We took it by position. Is it a great place to work if you're a cook versus if you're a server? We took it by gender. We took it by age group. And we learned some things that we weren't so happy about. And, um, and so we took it again a year and a half ago. And we found that we had, in fact, improved in a lot of areas, but we were still lacking in some areas. And we took it so seriously that we then hired our consultant from Great Place to Work, and she's now our chief culture officer. So if you, if you can't get it, just bring him in-house. And the biggest thing uh, that, that we learned out of that was that, that, by the way, we're doing really, really well. And while we've never submitted it to the competition to be on the fortune list, that, that our last survey, which was about a year and a half ago or so, we were just a couple notches below what would have landed us on that list. So we feel really good about that. But I'm not, now I'm not taking a, a page out of, I, I'm still taking a page out of my grandmother's book. I'm still focusing on the flowers, but I'm also, I also want to improve our swing. And the biggest thing we learned is that there was a gap between the culture that we espouse. People, they understand why we do what we do. And you don't need to read Simon Sinek to know that it's really important for people to understand why does this company exist? You know, there's a lot of restaurant companies out there. So people know it, they get it, and they like it. They really love the idea of enlightened hospitality. What they don't understand always is if that's the case, why does my boss not always walk the talk? Or why do they let that guy stay in the company? And what we learned was that in too many occasions, either because somebody had worked for us for many, many, many years, or because they were really, really good at what they did, we kind of made excuses that, you know what, we're going to work around that person because, come on, they're part of the family. We've learned to live with each other for all these years. But what we learned is that you can't have it both ways. You can't say that I care about advancing the culture and make cultural exceptions. And so what that has led to has not only been some really tough conversations where we had to always ask ourselves, is this person sending cultural mixed messages because they can't do the work or because they won't do the work? So that's, that's question number one. If it's a can't, we have a lot of patience to coach and, and to work with somebody. But still, we had to draw a line and say, if they still can't, then they can't work here. If it's because they won't, we have a, now we have a much shorter uh, attention span for keeping that person in the company. If that weed is never going to turn into a flower, it's never going to turn into a flower. And so we've exited a lot of people in the past couple of years, and they've been really, really tough. And then if you replace them, with flowers, you can, you can actually make an enormously powerful cultural shift very, very quickly by losing from the bottom and adding to the top. It's, it's really powerful to do that. So that's been probably the thing we've focused on the most. And the other thing, which I would say we learned, is that trust is the single most powerful factor in building the kind of culture you want. And that every single interaction that a leader has, or every single interaction that anyone on the team has with each other, it's binary. You're either building trust or you are diminishing trust. You, if I walk by somebody in the hallway of, of our office, and my mind might be thinking about 18 problems I'm trying to solve, but that person I'm walking by reads my body language as, <coughs> as if I'm not interested in the, the work they're doing. I may have just inadvertently diminished trust, and that's going to end up feeding into how it feels to work in this company. And then finally, what I would say that we've learned is that, that we didn't do a great job of. I, I was always really happy with how we had defined what we call the virtuous cycle of enlightened hospitality, which is 
uh, how we prioritize our stakeholders. What I had not done a good job of doing was to articulate the expected behaviors associated with supporting that, that um, cultural priority. And therefore, if I were to say the top priority in our company is how well you take care of each other, but I don't identify, and everybody gets that, but I don't identify the supporting behaviors, that can be interpreted a huge number of different ways. And so inadvertently, I had helped to create some, some monsters because somebody who was not holding someone accountable for their behavior was saying, yeah, but I thought I was supposed to be on their side. Because I had never said the best way to be on their side is to hold them accountable. We have a question right here in front. Yes. Um, firstly, I, I might assume that's your car up from the Trinity College sticker. So I'm glad that's still in your car. It, it's not my car, but <laughs> um, very proud of my alma mater, nonetheless. Um, so I, I had a question about uh, the role of finance in, in, in an industry that toes a careful line between creative expression and also the term profit sustainable over year over year, and the role that uh, financial statements are going to play in your business as you grow. Obviously, that's a bigger role now that you have those shareholders and Shake Shack group, and then as you went from one restaurant to many. Um, I'm just wondering, does the role of finance play, an inc I, I'd imagine it would play an increasingly important role as you expand. Um, maybe in the first one, you're just, let's go all at it, and you know, let's take food costs, and not really pay much attention to it, let's just get people coming back in the seats. Um, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how the income statement plays an increasing role. Yeah, I, I, another great question. I've, I've been aware since Union Square Cafe that, that in terms of my own wiring, finance was not my strong suit. And therefore, I would need to always surround myself with someone or someone's whose strong suit that is. In the same way that I'm not a pastry chef, but all right, go out and get a great pastry chef. You, you have no right as a leader to not fill every position with a, uh, a Hall of Fame player. At least that's what, your, that's what your, your goal should be. And you're absolutely right. At the beginning, the one financial move I made, which was really good advice I got from my late father, was that your lease is really the one thing that is um, kind of locked. You're not going to, you can, sh if, if you made a menu mistake, you can change the menu or change the chef. If you made a pricing mistake, you can change the price. If people don't like your uniforms, you can change your uniforms, but you can't change your lease. And the other adjacent piece of financial advice he gave me with respect to the lease was to always make sure that in your lease, you had the right to assign that lease to somebody else because at the end of the day, um, all of the equipment that you just bought, if you think your car depreciates the minute you drive it out of the parking lot, what do you see what happens with a fry later? You know, it's just like worth pennies on the dollar at that point. But your lease, if you pick a good piece of real estate, and we've always, or I've always really loved the game of trying to guess where a community is going to go, and furthermore, to try to hasten that evolution by being a player, by being an engineer. It's getting us in trouble right now because we can't afford to re-up at Union Square Cafe because the whole Union Square neighborhood has completely outpriced what an independent restaurant can do at that point. But uh, when it comes to, to finance, you're, you're right again. I, I never, th I just didn't, I didn't even know how to balance my checkbook when I opened Union Square Cafe 30 years ago. And um, unfortunately, I hired a bookkeeper who also didn't know how to balance his checkbook. <laughs> but Ultimately, I got, I got it right and started hiring really, really gifted people. The deals we do are the foundation upon which everything is going to work or not work. If, if you do a bad deal in the first place, you can be a championship restaurant, and you're, you're just never going to make ends meet. In a certain sense, we had that problem with the one restaurant we've closed in 30 years. It's called Tabla. It was a 13-year-old Indian restaurant. Um, it was really good. But we could never overcome 
the financial underpinning, which is that it costs too much to build it. And uh, if you're interested, there's a film you can get on Netflix called The Restaurateur, which tells the whole story of the building of Tabla and 11 Madison Park. But it costs too much to build it. Um, we had too many seats relative to the number of people who wanted to eat Indian food, even if it was great Indian food, 293 seats. Don't ever open a 293 seat Indian restaurant. <laughs> and, and our underlying occupancy costs were just, they were, it, it, it was, we were constantly, constantly playing on defense. And your defense gets tired if you leave it on the field too long. So finance makes a huge, huge difference, um, but it starts with the deal you do. And we've got an amazing team of, of financial reporters. Every restaurant has a, a head controller who lives in the restaurant, who has a matrix reporting both to the GM, who's the head business person of that restaurant, but also to the finance team at Union Square Hospitality Group. And there's so much fantastic software available today. So the role of finance in my opinion, is to keep our restaurant operators out of the office and on the floor offering great food and hospitality, but then not to dismiss them from being expert business people. What the financial reporting also does is to give them day-by-day -day reads on their labor reports, which is the, the make-or-break part of our business, and food and beverage costs, which is the other make-and-break part of our business the florist, the tablecloths, the insurance, all that stuff's really critically important. But if you can't know from a minute to minute basis what your labor, food, and beverage costs are, you're gonna be in, <coughs> in deep trouble. So unlike the first five to seven years of Union Square Cafe, where we didn't even do budgets, we didn't even, maybe we'd get our P&L statement three months after it happened, um, maybe. Maybe it was accurate. Um, Today, we, we get it on a, day, on a daily basis. Our chefs could tell you what their food cost is and what their labor cost model is. And that allows them not only to respond very quickly, but because we have such good reporting, they're actually able to spend more time with their recipes and at table side, which should make the experience better as well. Finally, what I would say is that um, I don't want anyone to think that because the virtuous cycle of enlightened hospitality begins with our staff, followed by our, our customers, followed by our community, followed by our suppliers, and followed by our investors, that that's a linear list and that we don't care deeply. We, we want to make more money than any other restaurant for a more sustainable amount of time. We just believe that if you begin by prioritizing your investors first, that's the best recipe not to make the most money for the most amount of time. We have time for, uh, for just one more. Okay. Yes. Um, so what's striking about uh, the competition today, um, especially compared with yesterday, Kevin Ryan, who uh, had a guild group at Business Insider. And a great trustee at Yale. Yes, he is. Uh, and about a dozen other successful businesses that uh, he's focused on the tech industry, and, but he's never been satisfied with just one successful company. And similarly, you could have just stopped it and you can have Square Cafe. What drives you uh, first to just keep wanting to open new restaurants and uh, diversify, but also just to stay in the food space? Well, I would argue, before I answer the question, that we haven't stayed just in the food space. So for example, we have a fantastic jazz club. All right, they serve food there. Um, <laughs> but hospitality quotient, for example, is not a, uh, a food business. It's a, it's a consulting business, because I like ideas, too, a lot. Um, and, you know, I'm on a couple, I've been on the open, I was on the open table board uh, for nine years before it became a public company and through the time that it was acquired by Priceline. So I love tech. I'm on a new board uh, of a company that founded by a Yale alum named Noah Glass called Olo, which stands for online ordering. And that's a, that's a tech business that's saying, all right, since there will always be fine dining restaurants where you make reservations, but there's also a whole new category called fine casual. Um, I just gave a TEDx Manhattan talk on the convergence of fine and casual dining. His company, Olo, is saying, 
how do restaurants who don't take reservations get insights on who their customers are um, in the fine casual world, like Shake Shack? I don't, I don't know as of this minute who are the thousands of people eating at Shake Shack or what their preferences are or how we can make the experience better for them. But with his product, I will be able to do that one day where you can order the food, pay for the food, and it'll be cooked the minute you get within you know, 500 feet of the restaurant. You can ultimately skip the line. So I like businesses. Here, here's the thing. There's, there's two answers to your question. If you are an entrepreneur, you know it because you never saw a good idea that you didn't think you could add something more to and that you didn't want to share your enthusiasm for with other people. It's not hubris, which is, you know, I walk around town saying, I could do that better. I, I know I can't do 99% of anything better than anybody else. But every now and then, there's just this sense that now is the right time for that idea and that I feel like I could add something extra to it. So that's thing number one, and it's a sickness. It, it, it is truly a sickness because the discipline that I have to have is to look myself in the mirror and say, no, stop it. <laughs> you have 18 other things on your plate right now, and not only are you not superhuman, but you can't do that to your team. It's not fair. But that leads me to thing number two, which is that I would say the biggest motivator I've had to grow is that if you want to field a championship team, and I would say there is not a greater pleasure I get in business than when I get to stand in any of our restaurants or, our, or at our home office or at the home office of Shake Shack. And I look around and I say, what a privilege to have people who are that good at sourcing great food, that good at finding great real estate, that good at graphic design, that good at finance. That's a, that's a privilege. And I know that if I don't give people both financial and professional opportunities to grow in their lives, then I don't have a right to surround myself with them. So that's probably the biggest motivator I have. That's a wonderful note to end on. And with that, I'd like to thank you on behalf of the entire community for your visit today. Thank you so much. Thank you.